what are we even doing? We're going to examine some asynchronous primitives in JavaScript uh, with callbacks. We're going to take a look at more modern approaches like promises and async await. We're going to take a look at pure script abstractions in the effect and af monad. We're going to learn just a little bit about fibers, which are almost threads. Uh, so, examples of one through three, we're going to take a look at uh, sort of simple event emitters. So this is a way to sort of reason about how JavaScript asynchronous uh, sort of appears to work. So this is uh, synchronous programming, but it, it can build up into an asynchronous kind of API or uh, essentially can uh, be used to sort of reason about the way that the browser allows us to do asynchronous programming uh, or node for that matter. So uh, here we have sort of uh, an emitter object. It's got this idea of some listeners, uh, which is a queue of functions that will grow uh, as we add them with on event. So we're going to add listeners and then we're going to fire off a listener. So this is where we get into sort of asynchronous appearing behavior where we can set up some events that then happen later on. So we can reason about these computations a little bit differently. We can sort of store some computation elsewhere and then fire it off. But again, this is still synchronous, right? Uh, we could sort of step through this code really easily without worrying too much about missing pieces, at least until we get into things that are out and stored in different modules where we, we have to reason about things a little differently. So this is a really basic uh, system. Let, let's go ahead and run this sort of uh, asynchronous foundation. Uh, so here we can see we, we have this idea of like starting the action, listener attached, and then even though we say pow up here, it doesn't happen until we sort of kick off this event. Okay, so it's a really simple sort of uh, scaffolding out of, of this um, computation that's going to happen later on, and then we can kick it off in a much easier way without defining all of the computations got to happen right at the moment when it has to happen. Okay, uh, so next we're going to move ahead. So we'll extend it, and we can actually add. We can add a lot of things to this. Actually, if we flip ahead, we can we can extend it to include event types, which is what we've done here. Uh, but we can also extend to different types of observable data, and we can extend it to do uh, all kinds of other things: state management. Uh, it's a good intuition for how DOM event listeners uh, operate. So if you want to add a button to a page and have events occur, it's it's also uh, sort of how uh, AJAX requests and, and networking requests are going to work. So here we have another example. We've got these two different event types, and I've sort of intentionally switched their order. So now we can we can sort of fire those off in in different orders uh, based on labeled events. So our uh, what used to be just one queue is now a map of queues to event types. Okay. Uh, and then we can have another sort of version of it where uh, instead we hold some, some data. And every time we, we change the data, we, we make that data available to some functions uh, for state management. Okay, So this is observable data. Um, you can see we also optionally give the ability to reference the previous value using variadic functions here. Um, so because we don't have a fixed number of arguments to our function type in, uh, in JavaScript, we're able to, to pull these kinds of tricks. Uh, these will get ironed out later on, but for now there are some conveniences that we can pull from this. Uh, so let's go ahead and run that example. And you can see uh, as soon as we change this initial value of hello to Bob, we get... Uh, First, the, the first listener going off and, and logging out the original value, hello. And then a second listener fires, uh, which is going to uh, give you the new value. Uh, so these could be supplying them out to other callbacks. They could be running um, network calls themselves. And you can, you can get this notion of a, sort of a chain of functions that call each other. Uh, building up a call stack, but potentially with asynchronous steps where you're not adding things to the call stack immediately. So uh, this brings us to sort of a fundamental problem. JavaScript is single-threaded, usually. Uh, worker threads don't count. They're a bit of a newer addition. But what I'm talking about 
is the fact that JavaScript runs with an event loop. And when an event is triggered, there's a call to an event listener that's placed in a queue kind of waiting for the event to resolve. And, and once the call stack is cleared of synchronous behaviors, the JavaScript runtime is going to start to execute listener calls from the queue. So it's it's sort of very similar to this, but the reality is that this emitter is uh, obscured. It's implemented off in the browser, maybe in C++. Uh, it's in the node core. It's part of uh, the web APIs that you think of as sort of the JavaScript base library. All right. Um, so uh, there's a really great talk on this that I can never do justice to. It's called What the Heck is the Event Loop Anyway? from Philip, Philip Roberts. And it essentially goes through just this with a lot more demonstration. So if you're interested in knowing a lot more about how the event loop works, I really recommend that as, as a great starting place. Now, uh, there's also some modern abstractions that have been added on to help us uh, prevent what's called callback hell. This idea of like, maybe we have so many listeners. Uh, and, and additionally, the, the old syntax for functions was very uh, big and, and relatively clunky relative to these, uh, these arrow functions that we're using. So we, we came up with promises. They're, they're sort of a wrapper for unfinished computations. They can't be canceled once once you start them off. So here, uh, we're using fetch, which is uh, an API for doing network calls. So we're calling off to this uh, AI um, age predictor based on your name. So there, there's a difference between this example and the previous examples. Here, we could trace through all the actions and never lose track of sort of where the JavaScript interpreter might be uh, operating and, and how it might evaluate out. But here we get to a point where we call fetch and we'll, we'll very quickly get confused because the fetch computation doesn't wait for us to call fire on any of these. It kicks off immediately through a browser API. Uh, so this returns a promise here. Uh, which we then call dot then on. Uh, but the computation is sort of running in the background in another thread that we don't directly control. And when that thread uh, completes and, and receives its response, uh, this is going to be kicked off. And then likewise, this is going to be kicked off. So we have this sort of chain of events. And, and if you squint, this is going to look a lot like a monad. And you don't have to squint that hard. Uh, this actually kicked off as, as a, this API was being discussed. There was a hot debate about adding uh, features like Monad to, to JavaScript. Um, however, uh, there is some convenience here because you don't really have to think about whether you're calling uh, bind or map on this. You can return promises or not promises. And that was determined to be the more sort of JavaScript friendly API. Um, now we also get some pleasantness that looks a little bit like do notation. So we get async await. Uh, and if you sort of equals await, if you squint that into an arrow, you might imagine this looks quite a bit like uh, Haskell's do notation, and you wouldn't be wrong. Um, the kicker, uh, because it is just like do notation, is async actually denotes that your return value gets wrapped in a promise. So then you, you can go ahead and catch for errors at the end, uh, just like you might catch uh some monad say that has monad catch or monad throw. All right. Uh, so we we have these sort of uh, functional like ty types of expressions where we can sort of uh, set up chains of computation uh, and also set up uh, binding do notation. Uh, but they're, they're, like I said, it's not cancelable. We haven't officially created monads or functors in JavaScript. And this is where the next great example comes from, because uh, there's this great library called Future. And Future uh, allows you to wrap up promises with a different type, which does implement monads and functors and bifunctors and alternative and all kinds of other abstractions that you might be familiar with. So if you are using JavaScript and you cannot use PureScript, this is a great system to use. It also has certain API helpers, like enforcing that you supply an error handler before you get to unwrap and get your actual value out. 
Uh, you can also set up uh, cancellation as well. So there's a lot of great things to, to get out of the Flutures library. There's also a way to do async await like syntax using iterators. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of great options for you with Fluture, but the main uh, problem that you might have is that Fluture's errors, they're great type errors, but they are at runtime, which brings us to PureScript. So with PureScript, uh, we are going to be talking about three different techniques, the, the effect monad, uh, promises, and, the, and their relationship to AF, uh, as well as uh, fibers. And we're going to be taking a look at some, some examples with fetch and AFJAX. Uh, so... Let, let's just move over to the examples. Uh, I've created a couple of simple wrappers here. I've created two wrappers. One is uh, it uses the fetch API just so that it, we're comparing apples to apples. But this fetch API, it's going to essentially just uh, take a callback and call our callback. So there's not a whole lot going on here. Uh, it allows us to just sort of have a, a, a callback like uh, interface in pure script. You'll also notice there's this uh, just nullary function. So we have currying here. We get the URL. We get a callback. And then this, this nullary function is an effect. So uh, when you talk about an effect in pure script, we're just talking about a, a, a lazy uh, value, uh, a function that is deferred. Okay. Now we've also got this one for promises. So this one is going to return uh, an effect with a promise inside. And we can change promises to uh, to afs and afs to promises. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, PureScript has two different types of effects. It used to have many more, but we've mostly gotten rid of them. So there's, uh, like we can return just a promise and say, oh, we've got the promise. But there's not really great tools for unwrapping a promise. You'll, you'll mostly want to use AF, unless you're returning it for a JavaScript user, maybe in a library. So what we've actually got here, we've got uh, first just a callback-based API, where we're, we're using our effect call. So we just supply a callback there. Let's go ahead and run that. And we get some compiler output, and then we, we actually get the effect itself running. And when we get a result, we'll uh, get the call backfired. It's stalling out for me, so I'll just uh, move ahead. Uh, so the next thing that we can do is uh, we can set up an AF. So here, we're getting the result uh, as an AF. And, and what we've done, we've got this fetch function that we've implemented in PureScript just using a promise helper to to unwrap the promise and supply it as an AF. AF gives us all of the powers of functors, monads, uh, bifunctors, oh my, and it's cancelable. All of the great features of Fluture. Uh, however, we're in a pure script context, so we can kind of reason about our types at uh, compile time rather than at runtime. Okay, let's go ahead and run that. Hey, and there's our output. So again, we're just outputting uh, text as things land. There's not a whole lot else going on. We're just calling log. All right. Um, so now we've got these sort of basic examples. Uh, what I wanted to do next was show a pure script native example. So let me just come down here. This is Afjax. Um, uncomment the code that runs it. So AFJAX is the AJAX library for PureScript. So we're returning an AF. We can do a native request. This has sort of full type, type safe uh, setup for your request. So here we can do uh, request with a get method, uh, a given response format. So you might be anticipating uh, a string response or a JSON response or some other response. You can actually set it up to do some of the parsing for you if you like. Uh, in this case, I'm just leaving it as a string, so we're not getting too much into the parsing world. Uh, but it's the same request, essentially, so we can run this as well. Okay, uh, so that's sort of the, the native way to approach this. There is also a shortened helper just called get, uh, 
which allows you to use much less of this. Um, but that is the, the basic idea of an Afjax usage. So one thing that you'll note about Afjax, and it's something that is common across quite a few peer script libraries, is it's distributed across a multiple modules for typical usage. So I'd say this is sort of a design principle across peer script is it's very, very modularized. Uh, so just be prepared for that, that you'll be jumping around all of the different modules in that library. Even compared to Haskell, it's quite modular. All right, so we talked about fetch, we talked about afjax. I do want to spend some time with fibers. So fibers are a really interesting feature. Fibers essentially allow you to take afs and uh, control these forked computations. So you can start to reason about af uh, as, a, as a unit of asynchronous computation. But a fiber is really a chain of, of asynchronous computations that you could then call various methods on. So you get to reason about it. You can see like the fork af, I think, is probably the most descriptive, uh, intuitive function that you might see coming from Haskell because it works exactly like fork IO. So you'll get IDs, you'll get uh, cancellation capabilities, and uh, you can join fibers, kill fibers. Uh, you can make a fiber invincible, uh, or you can make an af invincible. Um, so there's lots of different uh, capabilities that you can set up uh, for fibers and for working with complex asynchronous computations. All right, so just to summarize pure scripts approach to asynchronous computations, you get lots of different uh, type safe wrappers to define the outputs of unfinished computations. And you also get control over synchronicity and asynchronicity using effect and af. So effect is for all synchronous effects, which is why you have to supply callbacks everywhere. And af is for asynchronous effects. So you don't have to think about supplying callbacks. You can just operate on your data without too much concern about what is synchronous or asynchronous. Although it is clear uh, in your uh, notation which one is which, because we're in do notation. Uh, you also get type level knowledge of blocking operations, which is sort of, I guess, the colliery to the above. Uh, you get abstractions for chains of computations, which follow uh, familiar type class interfaces and laws. Uh, and you get the flexibility of flutures, but at compile time. Uh, and you get do notation. So let's go take a look at a production example. Uh, I want to show you a library that I've been working on. Uh, we're pulling in a bunch of WebSocket things. We're using the WS library in JavaScript. So we've pulled in a bunch of foreign imports, which are just wrappers around various library calls. And what we can set up uh, through a whole bunch of uh, layers around the specific WebSocket interface that we're using is this, uh, this query M monad which allows us to just have a reader T over some config and an AF. And it, it, this essentially allows us to set up some guarantees through uh, adding and removing listeners uh, sort of all over the place uh, as queries go out and come back to abstract over the fact that WebSockets don't give you good request response guarantees. And so uh, this sort of builds up a dynamic dispatch system. So you can see it, we do quite a bit here to build up a type safe dynamic dispatch system. We build up listener sets and uh, methods for adding and removing to a listener set. Um, but through this system, we actually have a very nice API for working with WebSockets where you don't have to concern yourself with a, like a mother listener that listens for everything that this WebSocket could possibly spit out we have it, but we have it sort of buried in some async helpers, uh, and we can abstract over it. So th this is a really, really uh, strong use of the AF monad, I think, in, in pure script. I encourage you to take a close look at this. Uh, this is the Cardano Browser TX library on the Plutonomicon. So this is one that I've worked on uh, with the team at MLabs. Well, uh, th that's it. Thank you for watching. Um, there should be a QA and a uh, session right after this if, uh, if I was able to be there in person. Uh, 
Just a reminder, MLabs is hiring Haskell, PureScript, and Rust developers at all levels. Uh, we're a premier blockchain consultancy working on Cardano, Solana, and Polkadot. Please take a look at MLabs.city for more details, and I will see you at the Q&A. Which PureScript async handling approach is mostly used in popular libraries in production? Uh, and am I using uh, Xmonad? I am using Xmonad. Uh, which PureScript handling approach, uh, async handling approach is most popular? I would say AF. I would say if, if you're going to get, if you're going to deal with any library that's doing network requests and, and quite a few others, uh, you'll see AF first and foremost, I would say. How can code using AF coexist with something that uses promises or some other API? Uh, yeah, let me let me share my screen quick because I, I just want to show you to a library. So once my screen settles down from Zoom being crazy with it, uh, there is this great. Uh, control.promise module, if you're on pursuit, that lets you freely convert to and from promises and AF. So to and from AF are all here. I'm just gonna flip back over to the chat as well. Yep. So that way you can sort of pass things back and forth from promises to AF, AF to promises. So especially if you're dealing with a JavaScript library returning promises, super, super common these days. Uh, you can flip back over to an AF really easily. Does AF support canceling a promise? If so, how? You know, that I have not dug into the specific way it, it cancels a promise. There, you certainly get a cancel method for any AF, but let's, uh, let's take a look over here. I don't actually see cancelers that get spit out in this library. So it may be doing something uh, just a little bit different than what you'll see over in the uh, like the AF library. So the AF library has a number of constructors to sort of build up an AF, but you'll see they always return like an effect with a canceller. I actually don't get that here. So it, it might be that uh, you can't generically just get a canceller out. Uh, it may be that it modifies your uh, promise callback in some way, but uh, you could always take a look at the source, I suppose. It's going to take me a while to parse that. Uh, I'm going to go with right now, they're not easily cancelable right out of the box, but I encourage you to take a look at the docs on that one. Uh, is there a significant performance difference? uh between using different handling approaches uh i don't notice a significant performance difference um but I, like certainly there, there is going to be some penalties some are going to be better than others i don't think one is severely worse than the other um but uh your mileage may vary There you go. Uh, Robert just confirms that promises can't be canceled because they come from JS land. Thank you, Robert. Does it make sense to write custom FFIs around HTTP calls like fetch? Uh, I wouldn't really do that in production. I, I would just reach for Afterax. Uh, if you really don't like the way Afterax is doing something, you, you do have the option. Uh, like I just was. I don't think there's anything super wrong with it, but uh, in general, I do prefer uh, working with AFJAX, at least working from PureScript. Um, working in JavaScript, I, I really prefer to work with futures. And again, like there's a, a to future from future sort of uh, set of methods in, in the futures library to go from a promise to a future. Uh, how does 
how does it compare with async await in JavaScript? I'm not quite sure what you mean by it, Anupam. Oh, uh, OK. So how does af compare with async await in JavaScript? I would say they're really comparable in terms of um, the sort of making asynchronous programming appear synchronous. Um, I, I, I see there's some back and forth also about promises and canceling. We'll, we'll get to that. Uh, but I would say AF is really comparable to async await, but with type more type safety. Um, certainly, because we're in uh, a, sort of a, a Haskell-like language, we're in pure script, uh, you know, it's going to force us to make sure that our binds and our lets are sort of separated out. Whereas uh, binds and map calls and, and lets with a, a promise or async await, uh, if you put a, an await call in a place where you don't need it, I don't think anything bad happens, uh, at least not last I checked. Um, so it looks like there, there's this uh, abort controllers, which I've actually not heard of, uh, but not every promise supports abort controllers. Is AFJAX using fetch or the old AJAX APIs? AFJAX does use older AJAX APIs. And in fact, uh, it uses the XHR2 library, I believe, in Node, uh, and the XHR uh, HTTP request from the browser. So it is an extremely old AJAX API, which gives you compatibility everywhere. And it means you're using an API that is very highly optimized because it's been around forever. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I suppose that's all questions. Take care. Have a great day. Thanks for watching.